welcome back to the CNBC special Captains of Industry, where I am joined by Joyce Msuya, who is the Deputy Executive Director at UN Environment and Assistant SG of the UN. So, we discussed about your early influences, we looked at some of the challenges that you faced. Tell us what you think are some of the drivers of your success thus far. Um, that's a good question. I mean, uh, the drivers of success are the following. I think now that uh, I'm a mother of uh, two wonderful kids, 20 and 15, uh, and a wife, I have a bigger sense of purpose. It's not about me. It's not even great. It's very clear that I have to leave a positive legacy for my children. That is one. I think two is using my international global experience to benefit and connect Africa to the rest of the world. One of the incentives for me to take this position it be based in Nairobi and leaving Washington was really to bring the wealth of experience that I've had to connect and do the opposite, bring Africa to the global stage. Third, which is my passion and a dream if and when I retire, is to use my platform and my journey as an empowerment for other African women. I have this deep sense of belief that if I can do it, if I could reach here, considering that I grew up in Tanzania, then anybody can do it. But it takes work, it also takes uh, mentoring. And I think lastly is this deep sense of making a difference. Whoever I meet, whether it's a driver, a security person, a president, I always reflect, did I make a difference in that person? So it goes beyond my children. What challenges have you faced as a leader specific to the industry? Um, one, I would say bureaucracy uh, and how do you influence, turn bureaucracy for innovation. I tend to push the envelope, come up with a thousand ideas. I've worked in large bureaucracies. So how do you actually making things work in a bureaucracy, particularly when it comes to innovation, efficiency and delivering results? I think two is constant adjustments. I've worked in big organizations that work in a political economy. So depending on what happens in the world, constant adaptability. But that has been very useful because I've managed to adapt since I've lived uh, in different parts of the world. I think the last challenge, which is personal, because I grew up in Tanzania, my father still lives there, I constantly ask myself, am I missing something? Because he's aging, my siblings are in Tanzania, but on the other part of the world, and wherever I've lived, I've extended, I've established my own uh, extension of the family. So those are the three uh, challenges that uh, constantly I reflect upon. Right. If you weren't working in this industry, which one would you be working in? You know, I love to cook, and I love, love interior designing. So I would probably be doing something about women, because I just love empowering uh, people that have to do with cooking. Maybe establishing a cooking school and bringing girls. And the cooking skills and interior decoration came from a boarding school in Werueru Moshi that was a former Catholic school and we had this amazing headmistress called Mama Kam, who really uh, educated and empowered a generation of Tanzanian women. So those uh, two things, even now, after I retire, I hope to do. Well, that was gonna be my next question. What would come after that? <sighs> you know, uh, now that I'm sort of opening the Joyce 2.0 chapter, after I've turned 50, I've been reflecting a lot, what would I do after when all this is said and done? Definitely something to do with women empowerment. I have a passion and I really want to develop the next future of leaders, particularly from Africa, leveraging my platform. Two, I want to do the hobbies that I've not had time to do. Cooking, definitely. I 
by the way, the way I cook is, I call it fusion cooking. So I think what spices do they use in India and how can I mix them with Rwandese and Tanzanians to make a unified dish? So I would like to do a little bit more cooking and uh, interior decoration. What would you have to say to a young girl or boy who's watching this, who aspires to be where you are now, uh, someone perhaps in Tanzania or somewhere else around the region, what would you have to say to them? I would say things that I actually sometimes tell my children. One is in life there is no shortcut. No matter where you are, whether you're in a primary school, in the village, you have to work hard. Two, what I have learned from my own experience, force yourself to do things that make you uncomfortable. For me to go to China, to go to South Korea, to move to Glasgow was not easy. But if I look back, that's where I got the maximum growth and maximum understanding of human humanity. So definitely don't do the easy things. Don't do the plain vanilla because you're not going to grow. Three, take risks. I went to China. I decided I was going to learn Chinese. Um, so take informed risks because no risk no reward and that risk could mean leave your region your village in Tanzania cross over and go to another part and lastly I would say never forget where you came from one thing I've learned about leadership you're going to face a lot of winds and tsunamis but if you're grounded and you know who you are as a human being and the value system then you will never let any organization or any context define who you should be. And that's extremely important. You know, allow me to just go back a little bit with the position that you have. I imagine that you have a passion for the environment, for our planet. Where did that passion come from? It came from a village called Usangi, uh, Mwanga district in Kilimanjaro. When I was growing up in Tanzania, every Christmas, every holiday, our parents would tell us you were going to the village, to go to church in the village, to see your grandmother. And Usangi is up in the mountains, you know, 45 minutes from Mwanga city, and it's full of nature. And I still remember the smell of the trees, the smell of uh, animals that were moving around and that shaped me to see how even in my grandmother's hut there were cows but also there were people and we had some of the best and simple meals as a family so when I became a mother and especially after spending 21 years at the World Bank group I looked at myself I said I've worked in health sector uh, as I mentioned before what is the biggest thing, especially as I think of my children's future, where I can make a difference? And environment stood out. But not just environment in isolation, environment and development. So how, when I go back to my village, how do we have the same type of animals, the forest that were there, but at the same time bring uh, wealth creation and poverty reduction initiatives for the villagers? And that's what drives me. Do you think that there is more awareness now amongst villages, as you call them, or people who, you know, are in different parts of the continent who aren't, who don't have access to the internet or who perhaps can't read, etc.? Do you think that there is more awareness amongst those people? My answer would be yes and no. I mean, if you look at the young generation now, and that's the hashtag technology kids. I mean, they know what is happening, climate change. We see, for example, children asking their parents, why are you buying plastic straws? Uh, you know, they're asking the right questions. So the technology connected population, definitely there's more awareness and more advocacy. I think because of the inequality story, which is a development story, the ones that have been left behind from the digital economy, they are not as aware as uh, the former group. But they also probe questions. Last week I was in Victoria Falls for this wildlife economy. Villagers were asking how come the water volume of Victoria Falls is lower 
this year compared to the previous years. Why? Because of drought, because there were no rains. It's climate change issue. So they may not articulate climate change, but they have observed, because they are fishing community, that the volume of water is reduced. And that's where I think we as community, international community, but particularly local community, we can do more to educate communities. There are a lot of community-based initiatives, like the one I mentioned in Victoria Falls, that we should also highlight at the global level to say the reason why you have less, it's because of climate change, and then uh, work with the communities to address it. You know, as we wrap up this sit down with you today, Joyce, I, I want to know, do you have a message? What message do, what is the Joyce message? <laughs> What's the message that you want to convey when you walk into a room? I want to convey positivity. I think despite what is happening in the world today, if you look at the world, including in this continent, 25, 30 years ago, we are much better off. So we should not lose sight of the investments of others that have made before us. Yes, we have challenges, let's address them, let's find solutions. So the message for me is look and strive to look at a glass half full rather than empty, starting from the household level. Uh, I think the second is the opportunities are enormous. I have had more opportunities than my mother. My mother had more opportunities than my grandmother. My children will have more opportunities. So let's not lose sight. Let's keep on pushing the envelope. I think lastly, I would say, especially for women, you can do it. We have many challenges. We tend to be caretakers of communities. I constantly check to see if my husband, my children is okay, but we can do it because we have the integrative skills of bringing people together and the world needs more togetherness rather than separation. Well, what a note to end on. Thank you so much, Joyce, for joining us on Captains of Industry today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. As you've seen, we just had a candid conversation with Joyce Msuya, who is the Deputy Executive Director at UN Environment and the Assistant SG at the UN. Make sure that you continue to watch this space. CNBC Africa is here for you. Thanks so much for tuning in to Captains of Industry. Hello, my name is Makeda Mahadio and you are watching a CNBC Africa special. Today we are joined by a microbiologist by trade. With over 20 years in her industry, she has held several high-level jobs at the World Bank and now she works as and now she works as a deputy executive director for UN Environment and assistant SG for the UN. Today she's going to tell us how she got there and where to next. Let's take a look at the life of Joyce Msuya. Thanks so much for joining us today. Let's get straight into it. I'd like to know more about your early influences. A microbiologist. <laughs> Tell us about how it all started out. Thank you very much, uh, Makeda, for having me. Uh, my journey started in Tanzania. I was born and raised in Dar es Salaam. Uh, January 1st, January 2nd, 1968. Uh, this was seven years after Tanzania got independence. And my parents were one of the first community organizers after independence. My journey really started from growing under Nyerere's leadership, the late President Nyerere's uh, leadership. I went to public schools in Tanzania 
uh, I went to national service as a Tanzanian it was mandatory to do national service which was pretty much uh, military training to give back to the community and I grew up in a family of six. I'm the first daughter, uh, three elder brothers, a younger brother and a sister. But what really shaped me, one is my parents' value system, one of giving back. From day one, every vacation, we would go back to the village in Kilimanjaro and volunteered in the community. So this sense of giving back to community was instilled in me when I was very young. The second is my father believed in science, even though he was not a scientist. He really encouraged, strongly encouraged all of us to do science. And he and my mother, my late mother, used to say, you can do science and switch into law, but you cannot do the opposite. So all of us studied science, and I took physics, chemistry, and biology. I also went to a boarding school, a former Catholic boarding school in Moshi, Kilimanjaro, that shaped me because it was a public boarding school with Tanzanians from all walks of life. So the embrace of diversity, Tanzania has over 126 different tribes, and thanks to the leadership particularly of Nyerere, he built a one nation. Whether you are Muslim or Christian, when we were in public schools, we were one and we were Tanzanian. And out of public uh, high school, I got a scholarship. One of the first young Tanzanian women that was sponsored by this foundation to go and study sciences. So I went to Scotland to study biochemistry and immunology. Why? Because I thought I wanted to become a doctor. Until I realized I was scared of blood. So I decided to do basic science and that's what led me to microbiology. Um, I went to Canada after I graduated from Scotland, University of Strathclyde, to do a master's in microbiology and immunology. And for my master's thesis, I chose to focus on HIV AIDS, because at that time, HIV AIDS was becoming a big problem in Africa. And again, I thought if I could specialize in HIV AIDS, I could come back and give back and make a difference in Tanzania. Little did I know, after microbiology, I would move on to do public health policy research and joined the World Bank Group in 1998. And I had a fantastic career. I joined as a health specialist, working on health projects, mostly in Africa. And then I moved on to development economics to do research around development, the multi-sectoral nature of uh, uh, development. Uh, in the office of the chief economist. Then, thanks to the World Bank Group options, I moved to the private sector to understand how can private sector make a profit but also make a difference. So I moved to the IFC, the International Finance Corporation. And there I worked on a number of uh, transactions, a private sector in Africa, in Latin America. Again, it exposed me. And uh, from uh, IFC, I saw a job to be based in Beijing, China. By then I was married and I had two kids and a supportive husband. So I decided to apply for a job to be based in Beijing, China, as the regional coordinator for World Bank Institute, covering all of East Asia and Pacific region. Right. Tell us about one or two major milestones that have brought you to where you are today in your career. Uh, two major milestones. Uh, one, I would say definitely national service. Uh, I mentioned after high school in Tanzania, I went to national service. I grew up in the city, I went to boarding schools. But national service brought the work ethic and resilience that really has propelled me to where I am. When I left Tanzania and I went to Scotland, for example, in Glasgow, I didn't know anybody. Frankly, I went to Glasgow because I was curious about the Scottish accent. But then when I landed there, I had to find out where do you buy food, toothpaste, but I learned the survival skills from my national service. I think two is the gratefulness. When I attended the national service, I really came to realize how blessed I was. I realized then how other Tanzanians 
had very different upbringing and not the privileges that I had when I was growing up in my own household, including, for example, being given as an opportunity as a woman in a family. That has also, if I look at my experiences in Asia, in the US, where I spent a significant part of my life, that has been uh, quite a, a good skill for me to have. And cross-cutting is hard work. Everything I've had, I've had to work extremely hard. Every position I've had, I've had to apply and compete with other uh, people uh, across the world. And I think lastly, some people would ask, how did you manage to compete growing up in Tanzania? I think the lesson in my life is even good public education system can actually prepare somebody to compete at the global level. The foundations of my education came from Tanzania, from Form 1 to Form 6. By the time I left Tanzania, I was already shaped and honed as a human being. But it's the foundations, academic, from Tanzania that have allowed me to be here. You said that you're reminded of your gender, and we've seen the numbers of women in boardrooms, in leadership positions. Sure, they're growing, but they're still very, very low. How is it being a woman in a leadership position in these huge institutions that you've been involved with throughout your career? Yeah, so it's been quite interesting, but also I'll tell you something. You know, when I was at the World Bank Group, most of my bosses were men, African and non-African. I, as a woman, I decided to become a student of how men operate in leadership capacities. So I actually, up to today, I have a book where I write skills that I admired of my bosses that I worked for and skills that I did not admire. And it's very interesting, and I constantly go back to the book to see how am I doing as a leader. So I think one is, instead of looking at how others, other genders are doing things, we can also learn as women. And I have enormously learned from some of the men bosses that I've had. For example, I had a boss who used to say, family is a priority. And he would leave the office, even though he was in a very high position at 6.30, to go and have dinner with his wife. And suddenly I realized, oh, if he can do it, I as a mother can do it. And his career did not suffer. So it validated my priority, family as number one. I think the second is we women tend to be very good at networking, at bringing people together. What I have learned is the higher you climb, especially in leadership positions, the role becomes one of bringing people together, of resolving conflicts, of finding solutions. And I would actually argue women have much stronger skill set in that compared to men. The question is how do we capitalize on it? So I have mentors who are women, who are mothers, and I constantly go back to them and I said, how do you do this? How? So developing and leveraging the networks that we have, which comes naturally for us. Is right. You know, in the types of positions that you've held throughout the years, especially leadership positions, you have to be able to innovate. Mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us about an example or two of some innovations that you are proud of and that have helped you to further your career? Um, I have uh, many, but I'll, I'll give you one example. And it was again influenced by my upbringing. I have always looked at my leadership role as one of clearing the path for the troops to come and move forward. So I like solving problems, but also I like to push teams to actually deliver above their capacity. I'll give you two examples, one from Africa, the other one from Asia. When I joined the World Bank Group, I was working on a health systems project that was focusing on delivering drugs to communities. We realized the uptake of drugs, we were working with a number of partners, was not very high. I worked with my boss then and other partners. I said, why don't we go to the villages and listen to the villagers, including the head of the village, to see 
if they can come up with their own system of delivering the drugs rather than us bringing uh, a system that had worked elsewhere. And initially there was hesitation, but I give credit to the team. We had what we call community-based uh, delivery of drugs. And we found out in most traditional African society, for example, if somebody has died, if there is a wedding, the whole community comes and they share. And we leverage that network at the village level to develop a community directed, they owned it. What that did, it ensured sustainability. Even after the donor support program left, the communities were still uh, doing that. And up to today, that particular disease is 97% eradicated from Africa. I mean, it was collective efforts, but that played a role in terms of sustainability. The other one is Asia. I was selected to open the first World Bank Group office in South Korea. I moved from Beijing to South Korea. I didn't know anybody. I had teenage kids, a very supportive husband, and I had to hire the team in South Korea from scratch. The beauty about South Korea, there is rich human capital, and I got the best of the best. By the time I left three years later, the World Bank Group partnership with South Korea was really solid. But more importantly for me, it was nice to see the staff that I hired literally from scratch, how they b blossomed to become professional. And just uh, about a month ago, I went back to South Korea to uh, attend a wedding of one of them, my third uh, staff, who is now joining the World Bank Group after doing extremely well academically and that makes me very very proud wow joyce we're getting lots of good gems here we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back you are watching captains of industry on cnbc africa we'll be back after this short break <laughs> 